So I'd like to talk about using a resource that in this particular example many of you have in your homes. So in many residential homes or even in, in bigger houses you have a gas or oil heater somewhere in the basement that heats water uh, that you want to use for your shower or maybe for heating the room which will be when you use it at the temperature of 40 to 60 degrees or so. And for that you use a flame that can easily exceed a thousand degrees Celsius. And for anybody who knows, uh, has had some thermodynamics class, you know a temperature difference like this is a resource because you can use temperature differences to create, um, uh, to, to create other useful energy. One way of use doing this in principle would be to use the thermoelectric effect, um, which is basically a, a very general phenomenon that you can observe in pretty much any piece of material that conducts uh, electricity, could be a metal, could be a semiconductor, which basically says if you keep one end warm, the other end cold, you will in general observe a voltage happening between the two ends, an electric voltage. And of course, if you close the circuit, you can run a current. And if you can run a current, then in principle you can use this for something, so you could go back to your house and switch something in between the flame and the, and the hot water and, for instance, fire, uh, use your li light bulbs. This is an application that, there's many other applications like this. People talk a lot also about using waste heat in cars, for instance. There's trucks driving around that do this, that do, um, generate all the electricity using a thermoelectric effect. The issue is that there is basically no material so far that do this effectively enough and cheaply enough that it would be worth using this on a very large scale. And where it would be economically worth, there's usually an issue with the, either the supply of the raw materials you needed for this or even their toxicity. So at the moment we have a material science issue in trying to provide materials that do this efficiently enough to make it really useful on a large scale. Before I go into what nanostructures can do for this, I'd like to just back up a little bit and talk a bit more about how thermoelectrics really works. And would like you to imagine your last visit to IKEA, for instance, where if you have kids, I'm sure they spend some time in the um, ball pit, I learned this is called. So if you imagine your piece of material as a ball pit and the balls are the electrons, they sit in there and on average don't move left or right. But what, what heat means is the motion of all particles, electrons, atoms, everything starts moving more when you heat it. So one way of doing this would be to feed one, of, feed one of these kids with some sugar and put that kid on one end of the ball pit. And if you wait a little while and just let things happen as they do, then you will end up that the balls will end up on one side and there is no balls left on the other side. And this is basically what random, undirected thermal motion can do for you that on average particles move in the other direction. Um, the question is then how to do this very effectively and efficiently. And it turns out from a material science point of view, there's two requirements needed at least that are surprisingly different to combine. The first is that you need a material that if you apply a temperature gradient to will provide a large amount of electric power, which means you need a material that provides a large voltage for each degree temperature difference you apply, you get the maximum voltage out and you want it to be as conducting as possible so that the voltage actually drives, drives a current. And current times voltage is power, so you get po power output. At the same time, however, you need to realize that the material that you're using is connecting your resource of a hot material or hot gas or heat bath to a cold one, and the temperature difference is your resource. If the temperature difference goes away, your resource is gone. So the last thing you want is for heat to flow from hot to cold without running a current, and that's called thermal conductivity. So you want a material that has ideally zero thermal conductance, but ideal electric conductance while producing a large temperature gradient. And in particular, the two electric and thermal conductivity are hard to achieve because they're actually related to each other. If you, in general, if you have electrons that conduct electricity, they also conduct heat, and there's, it's a very fundamental relationship. And this then explains why people are interested in nanothermoelectrics. This is basically the fundamental insight for this was provided in particular by Mildred Resselhaus more than 20 years ago, who wrote a couple of what she calls very simple papers, but they contain a lot of proof of, of truth. The first one is the insight that if you, non, if you provide nanostructuring to materials, you generally suppress heat flow. So the idea is simply 
There's many ways of, of doing this, but basically if you take a material, break it down into small pieces that make them stick together literally or do it in some other way, then if you, the pieces are small enough that they're smaller than the mean free path of the phonons. The phonons are the waves that carry the heat and they can travel for a while in one direction and then they scatter. The longer they travel, the more heat they can produce. So if you reduce that, that length, then you can slow down the heat flow. So if you make nanostructures that are smaller than the mean free path of these phonons, which t turns out to be typically on the range of 100 nanometers or so, then you can reduce the heat flow, and this can be done in many different ways and works very well, actually. So that part is cool. The cool thing then is that you, in principle, with the same nanostructuring can do a trick, and namely the other part of producing power, the, the keeping the power output of a thermoelectric high, is to know which electrons to pick, to let that kid in the ball pit not just throw balls randomly, but to know exactly which balls to pick out and use those that conduct, that, that use the heat resource the most efficient to get current out of there. And for that it turns out that low dimensional materials, so again nanostructures where you reduce the dimensionality, the, the range over which electrons can move, if you reduce that, you create energies where electrons can conduct, electri can conduct electricity or, and energies where they can't, and then you can in principle generate energy filters that pick out those electrons the most efficiently that you want to use. And the, the key thing here is that it's the same knob, making materials smaller that can reduce the thermal conductance and up the thermoelectric power output in principle. The question is then how to do this. There's a number of ways of doing this. Um, ultimately, nobody has really found the breakthrough. But one way of doing this is to use nanowires because they, have, they combine these two properties. On the one hand, the, the electronic structure can be designed such that one in principle should be able to get very high thermoelectric power output, which you can do as one parameter by making them thinner. And making them thinner has been shown, this works very well, to suppress the thermal conductance. In very thin nanowires, the thermal conductance can be as much as a hundred times smaller than in the bulk material out of the same material. And in particular in Lund, we also know how to make fancy structures inside the nanowire, so there's some hope if you know exactly what you want that you might actually be able to do this. To approach this, we have been looking at model systems, so this is a quantum dot at the top left here, a quantum dot embedded into a nanowire, so a very well-defined structure that allows electrons to only exist at very specific tunable energies which we can use to exactly pick out at which energy we want to conduct electrons. And that can be used to, for example, um, by choosing the level where you put your electrons to either have electrons go one way and the holes being blocked or the other way around. So you can even produce, choose the sign at which you want to produce thermoelectric current. And by then using more or less heat, you, you can use, uh, get different amounts out of that. So we understand that very well. We have even been able to measure the power output from a single nanowire um, or a single quantum dot. One single quantum dot does about a femtowatt. That's a number to take home. The, the energy consumption of the Earth is, in the, is, is numbered by terawatts, so there are some orders of magnitude in between. But quantum dots are small, so there's hopes. The, the question is then, can we take this all the way to at least have one whole nanowire produce more thermoelectric power than the bulk material out of which the nanowire is made. And in spite of the fact that this was predicted 20 years ago, nobody has actually managed to do this so far. Until very recently, when we were able to do this at least at low temperatures in an indom arsenide nanowire, actually several different samples. The data on the right are very complex, but I'll break it down for you. So the black line draws out the best guess the material out of which this, which this nanowire is made, if you had a block of material, so a chunk of a millimeter or so, this is the thermoelectric power output you would expect from that material. And with what you observe in the nanowires is something like this, depending on the individual choice that you're using, where at least at low temperatures, below 20 Kelvin or so, there can be up to 10 times more thermoelectric power output than from the bulk. This had on the one hand, this is only at low temperatures, so we clearly need to up this to room temperature. On the other hand, this had never been seen before, so there's hope that this actually can work. Um, what gives even more hope is that the effect that causes this is actually a little bit of an accidental effect. We think it has to do with the inhomogeneity of the wire. No wire is perfect. They always have defects in them, or on the surface, or somewhere else. And we believe what happens is that if we 
if we tune into the right sort of amount of electrons in the wire, that puddles are forming in these valleys, in these un unintentional accidental valleys at the bottom of the nanowire energy structure. And in a sort of quantum mechanical process, we believe that the energy states in these quantum dots that are similar to the quantum dots that we studied before can couple such that they actually produce current through the whole nanowire, but only at very select energies, giving us this boost that we also had from the uh, quantum dots. The advantage with this is that we see this in relatively thick wires, much thicker than originally had been um, anticipated, which was a worry because very thin wires are hard to handle, thicker wires are easier to handle, and in particular because it's kind of a dirt effect. It also lowers the expected material requirements in terms of quality to something that's actually realistic. So we may actually be able to use this at some point if we can tune the effect so that we can observe it at room temperature or maybe even above. And if we can do this, then one can, we will have all intention to piggyback of other technology developed in Lund. You will see structures like this in contact of solar cells later, where one knows already how to order many nanowires into a structure with contacts on them and so on. And then we will be able to use this as well for devices. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heiner. So that gives fascinating future, huh? when you will t uh, handle these difficult things. There is a question. <coughs> oh, there. <laughs> so what is the roadmap to, for, to higher temperatures when this can be put into, you know, use what I call a more uh, modern I, or I cannot, common applications? I cannot possibly give you a timeline because it simply hasn't been seen at room temperature yet. We have plans to now systematically, again, make, make um, systematic studies to, to create these accidental quantum dots more systematically and tunable and try to understand what it takes to go to higher, to, to higher temperatures. Um, given that the first step took, step took 20 years, I guess the, it might take some time. But on the other hand, we have a handle now. I mean, this is the key thing. When you have a signal, you can tune it. So it might be a few years. We don't know. What future? Ah, all very. There, there's a question. You up see there. someone? Yeah, yeah. yeah there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in in this system, it seems that you reduce the number of conducting electrons very strongly, which means probably very bad electrical conductivity. So. Well, the, this is this is the the trick that the, the reason nobody has seen this so far is that if you if you try to go for perfect one-dimensional density of states at the energy levels, well, first of all, you need a perfect nanowire. But by the time we, and nobody had, well, there's, there's very few experiments that have to actually have seen proper one-dimensional behavior. But typically, by the time you get there, the conductivity is gone. So the product of the two doesn't do anything anymore. This effect happens higher up in the carrier concentration. So we still, this is exactly the compromise that you need to achieve. Okay. Thank you, Heiner. Yeah, thank you.